setting up your meeting for Facebook Live. Meeting is meeting now is streaming live on Facebook. It works. It works. All right. Well, I have no idea if anyone's going to watch this, but hi, Abba. Hello, my son. It is nice to see you. Here we go. We are live on Facebook. I can yeah. see it. So Amazing. I think we should, we should probably structure this conversation and say something of substance. Yes. Well, it's been a um, interesting Pesach zooming seder with you and the family, and with 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 the Baruch and Dota Sarah. Um, but then again, second seder was just Iman me, and gave us time to you know talk a little bit about this or that, and just do all the parts in the seder quietly. So it's a different experience than having uh, everybody around the table, you know, yeah. and everything. I wonder about that. You know, the when the Mishnah says, when you have the choice, ask a child, and if not, ask your partner, and if not, ask yourself. And ask I used yourself. to think, I used to think that was an academic, you know, theoretical thing, but it seems like um, that's actually a real situation that the rabbis must have encountered, though not like us. They live in a different world. I mean, listen, there's a Mishnah that talks about how Tokea betoch habor, right? Who blows a shofar in when he's in a pit, right? Mm -hmm. And we're thinking about shul, everybody's there, getting on the bima and blowing a shofar. What's this guy doing it? Well, because he was by himself. I learned that with Gershon Cohen, Meizal, okay? And, and um, you know, he, and we, we were all explaining, and he says, well, what's going on there? Tell me what's going on there. And we, we, were, we were just mystified what he was looking for. And he was a man was by himself for for Rosh Hashanah, for, um, for Rosh Hashanah. Hmm. and he wanted to be you know Mikhail Mitzvah Hashofar, and and so but so he went in the pit, but he had to ride hide from the Romans, so he went in the pit, blew the shofar, hmm. but he was by himself. That's why the mission about talking about who you ask the question to had a different world experience than we have families around the seder table. So how would you, if you were looking for a metaphor, given, given that, I mean, in the ancient world, if they could speak in a, in a code that took some deciphering, right? So tokea babor, someone's blown shofar in a pit, which makes no sense without the context, right. is, is actually, I'm committed to my tradition, to fulfilling it no matter the circumstance, and I have to hide right now, right? So our circumstance is different from that. We are committed to the tradition, and as bizarre as the technological connection is, because it's something you and I never would have done right. in, in a previous incarnation, um, how would you describe it to a future generation? Like, how could you paint a picture of it? Well, they would have to understand somehow the reality of what it means to be inside a pandemic. Okay, I had once said to you that there's very little writing that I'm aware of that talks about people's personal experiences in the pandemic of 1918. There's other writings about it, but they, they didn't have these means of recording and they, I don't know what they wrote in terms of books, but how did they survive that without being able to be connected electronically? I don't know. How did they do shopping? There weren't takeouts, so they had how they get food. All of the reality, we will there will be reality recorded, written, and everything about this period of time, which is not over. So the, for them to understand Seder, in what we have experienced, they will have to read and learn about the context, which will be accessible to them. We don't know I, when I teach Gemara in my class tomorrow. I often try to bring them the reality that is that is surrounding the text because otherwise it's just text. Mm. But it makes no sense without the reality to understand. So Choni, the rabbis in, in, talked about Choni Ma'agal because he was, as, as, as um, Aaron Agus talks about in his book, the, uh, the Binding of Isaac and Messiah, he is seen through that prism as a martyr. Okay. We have to understand that the, 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 the Mishnah material is contemporary with, with, with the Hurban Habay, the destruction of the temple, and with the Bar Kokhba rebellion. People were martyrs for the cause. When I asked them, besides Masana, they, do you know the other Masana? Somebody knew Gamla. Right. 
Okay, so so therefore, um, uh, without the context, why the Gemara goes off on this tangent about Chomi, mm -hmm. right? It, okay, it's a nice, sweet story. We use it for Tu B'Shvat, but it doesn't make any sense without seeing the whole story of Choni, and therefore I was able to put it into context for the class, which the Gemara doesn't do. That's fascinating. One of the things that it's suggesting to me, and I, I don't think I would have come to this without that specific framing of the large picture by a letter, later generation, is that perhaps my question, how can we describe our situation to a later generation? The answer is we can't. It'll take their, their perspective to look back at the total picture that even though we have so much information, we don't have. And for them to describe a situation that we are in, because no matter how eloquent, analytical, self-aware we might think ourselves to be, we, we don't have the whole picture. We don't have the whole picture, but it's also because people people look at past events from where they are and can only use and use whatever's available to help them inform their vision of what they're looking at, but they can never be in that other place. Right. Okay? You know, you know, it says that everybody should feel that as if they went out from Egypt as if they went out from Egypt, right. not as the, that, that they cannot feel themselves as the Israelites that went out from Egypt. Right. We can only retro, retroject ourselves backwards, but only it's ourselves. We cannot know what the Israelites felt. All right. Well, you're, what you're saying, it's interesting, you're using the, the word ke'ilu, the as if. Yeah. As, as historical consciousness. The best we can do is as if. As if. Only people there at the time know what it means to feel in that time. Okay? You can describe... Yeah. Well, describe. There's, a, there's, a, there's a paradox there, if you don't mind me saying. There's a paradox in what we were saying before and that truth too, right? Only the people, only we understand what it is to go through this and you and I, as two individuals, might be a we, but you have a different experience than I do. Right. So only, only I can experience what I'm experiencing right now, and only you can experience what you're experiencing now. But a later generation will understand the context better than we are able, given our limited experience. Right, because they'll, they'll have a vantage point. We're sitting inside it. They're going to have the vantage point from outside of it to look at the, the whole... The whole picture. Um, I was going to say something a moment ago. Well, I, I cut you off admiring no. your wisdom. So. No, 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 no. <laughs> I, don't, I don't. I don't remember what I was going to say at that at that moment. It's oh, I know. You know, um, people often ask, where well, you'll see it on on Facebook. You know, from a from a memory thing about. You know, do you remember where you were the day that that uh, such and such happened? Kennedy was shot. John Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, Martin Luther King. Do you remember? Okay. And I can remember exactly. Exactly. And I can remember the emotions. I remember exactly what it, what, what went on. Okay. But the feeling of that experience, that experience itself is not transmittable. It's only the information about the experience. Hmm. Okay, I was I was in English class, the top floor of my high school building, which was a layered building, and we all had these boxes on the wall, a single box with a speaker, which we would get announcements from the office. And it came over that, and the teacher just closed everything, and we just sat there. And we sat in class until the school was dismissed. And Safta Kuna came on the bus, I was taking the bus home from high school to the other end of town, and the synagogue, and we were sponsoring the Onik Shabbat that Friday night in honor of Dr. Baruch's birthday, my birthday, my and, and Saba and Safta's anniversary. And Safta was in, it was Thursday, and Safta was in the synagogue preparing Onik Shabbat. So she didn't hear anything. And she gets on the bus to stop before we get on the next stop from the high school, and she sees everybody's face, and she says, What's gone on? And we tell her. Hmm. 
and she implodes from that as we've been seeing processing this imploding scene. So, you know, I can describe that, but I cannot make someone feel what I felt as an eighth grader. It's very overwhelming. So therefore, nobody can feel how you're feeling now. I can tell them about it. And I hope that they will never go through this, but who knows? But can you, I, I think I have two questions in response to that. Can you, it's not that I want this for you, but mm -hmm. you're recounting that with such sharp memory. Can you feel when you tap into it, what you felt? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So oh, yeah. Even, so even though the closest I can get, even as someone who's so connected to your heart, is a ke'ilu, as you said, is it as if, it's what uh, Bialik called kissing through a veil. Yes. Right? Right. So even though I can't connect, I can't access your direct emotions, I'm wondering if they're, <clears throat> and this is, you know, we're, we're speaking during the week of Yom HaShoah, after Pesach, where questions of storytelling and transmission are pivotal for, for the world and certainly for, for our people. I wonder if, if there is a way to truly transmit testimony. I mean, we're on the, we're on the, the cusp of losing direct testimony, God forbid, but it's such a big question right now. Again, it's a key, it, it, it'll, it, from in history, from where you are to what has been can only be a ki'ilu. It can only be a key healer because you're not there. We can never, we can hear that, we can, we, we've, you and I have both known many survivors. And some of, some of the people, we, we, we've both known the same people. You've known others and I've known others. But we can never know in the multi-layered meaning of the word what it was to go through those experiences. You remember, you, I, we remember that Dora Sara's father, Rudolf, one Thanksgiving when we would buy Dobrok and Dora Sara, I think you were there, and I had brought up my charts, right? And then he walked in, saw what Dobrok and I were talking about, and he started naming the names of his family who died. Bronya and Dorasara both knew he had had family. He never, ever, before that moment, told her or her whom they were. Mm -hmm. And I took a legal, the big legal pad, and I started scrib scribbling all this down. And I gave it to Dorasara, and I said, Dorasara, now you sit down with your father and fill this in. I don't know if she ever did or not, I don't know. But the point of the matter is, I can not replicate what I felt and hearing from this man, knowing he never told his, his wife nor his daughter. And this way, he's giving testimony, but I cannot feel him, his feeling giving testimony. I only knew my feeling hearing testimony. So when we have the videos and all the interviews of the survivors that we have, we cannot know in the depth of that word, their feeling, but we can, each person sitting there can have their feeling in hearing the testimony, hearing and watching the testimony. They won't be able to hug these people. That's the time, passage of time. O only, I mean, my heart is beating so intensely thinking with you and feeling with you we began by talking about sort of Pesach and what it is to go through, there's something meta here, by the way, you're drinking from a mug with my face while I watch you drinking it. Yes, it is. While it other is. people watch me watching you watch. Yes, yes. <laughs> the, um, we began by talking about, you know, what it is to have Seder, the two of you, and to zoom in with us and, the strangeness of ritual and memory. And then we talked about how stories are told by later generations and how your ability to frame stories from the Talmud for your students 
is based on a historical consciousness that the participants in the original stories couldn't have had, and that our memories are at best, um, are, are our best attempt to reconnect both to fact and whatever kind of emotions we can learn from the past. Right. And we mentioned it specifically this pandemic, this moment, and what it is to, to try to share it with later generations, and at least my organic thinking around it, that that's a really tall order given how many stages of separation, please God, there should be from this experience and our descendants. So I, you know, one of the questions that I'm, I'm actually left with, because we don't, we don't have forever to, to talk about this right now, but is, and, I, and I, maybe I'm praying that this be true as I ask it, is it possible for us to successfully share our experiences enough that our descendants learn from the ravaging emotions that all of us are going through right now so as to prevent this? Meaning the only way I imagine the urgency being felt by future generations is for us to successfully communicate why this should never have happened and what we have to learn to minimize the impact of future future disasters. So can I think what I'm asking in essence is, can we communicate both fact and the emotional reality of this to motivate the future to be better than what we have right now? Talking about our descendants and what they are, what they can do. I'm not sure that's the question. On a higher level, it would be whether they whether you know they can avoid pandemics and whether they will have vaccines faster for you know all these things. That's a different question. The real question that I think you need, what you're asking is, should there be a situation like this again? Will what we have learned from this experience be transmittable in a way that the next generations, hopefully far from now, but they could access for themselves to help them deal better with it. You know, Ima and I have not felt loneliness because we have each other. You and the kids came down last July. We hang on to that moment. We've been Zooming, um, Zooming with Sierra and Arsene and the children, children, all right? Zooming with, you know, Yonina on occasion, mostly telephoning. We have had now, we have developed a methodology of dealing with this that has kept us sane, stable, strong, and it works. It works, quotes, all right? Can we transmit our feelings of how we did Seder? What it meant for Saft and I to zoom in on Rosh Hashanah and Kippur with you, which we had never done. I mean, that we weren't with you. We, we, you, you were my second rabbi for a couple of years. You were together. Okay. But the point of the matter is, is that Rosh Hashanah and Kippur is spent in shul. It's not zoomed. That's not where I grew, grew to as an observant Jew. And otherwise, it would have been davening alone in the house. This way, we davened with you, heard some Torah from the others that, that preached, etc., and had a, had a Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur like none, no other. That experience, how we came to accept the fact that we needed to Zoom for, for the Yontif, needed to Zoom for Seder, what it meant to sit in front of a computer screen and not in front of a bima. Right? That ability to do that can be discussed, recorded, and transmitted. That someone could listen to us talking about it, read about it, maybe watch the videos of some of these Zoom, Zoom services. And maybe it will inform them of how they need to deal with the reality, because their reality doesn't have to be the same reality we just lived through. Mm -hmm. Hopefully a lot better, but who knows? So, you know, we're not going to be able to prepare the next, unless you're a bunch of scientists, you know, about what they can do about this, but we can teach them as human beings from the experiences that we've had. 
how we reacted and how we dealt and how we responded. And that can inform them because we had nobody to lean, nothing to lean back on. Not that they could have had Zoom in 1918, but we did not know what they did. We don't know how they felt. You know, my grandparents were all young people at the time. Grandpa Lebov, Grandma Lebov had no had no parents here, but Grandpa Creditor was here with his with his with his father, Great Grandpa Harry. What did they do? Of course, I don't know. Yeah. Or anybody in their group, their generation. We will leave testimony of what we did, how we felt. And if another generation needs to go through this, maybe they can consult it and help them in a way we did not have. Yeah. Maybe it's maybe it's the the wish that every that every generation has for their children. I'm looking at you, imagining that you felt it for me and for Yanina and Sierra, um, that we should be spared, you know, some of the things that you went through that we didn't. And certainly it's what I feel looking looking at, at our children. You know, may they be spared some of the lessons we felt unprepared and overwhelmed by. I hope they're spared that this should never happen again altogether. Amen. You know, that's that's certainly, you know, uh, you know, the ultimate prayer that this, you know, you know, Oseh Shalom should be real, a real peace, not, not, you know, not a treaty, not a pact, you know, a real peace of people don't experience the terrible things again. Isn't that just to go full circle? Right? We'll, we'll close with this for now. Isn't that one of the Choni stories, though, that he he fell asleep? He was the, the original Rip Van Winkle. Yes, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a second level story about him. Right. That, second, and he fell asleep for 70, 70 years, 70 years. So it's not that not that we should go to sleep for so long. But, you know, if we were to if we were to wake, if we were to wake, then I, maybe the, the blessing that that I, I would hope, that I would hope is that, first of all, these kinds of tender conversations that only because of this bizarre technology that is, it's allowing us to hug each other. Yes, it is, it is, it is. Uh, you know, <laughs> um, only because of this, may, maybe, maybe, they'll, maybe they'll listen to this conversation and say, you know, uh, uh, with your wisdom, you know, we have a, we have a way even if it's a ki'ilu step removed, um, of learning from what what our our family tried to teach us. Precisely. Yeah. Precisely. Well, here's here's what I'm gonna say, my Abba. This is pretty cool. It is terribly cool. I totally want to do cool. I want to do this again. Sure. Okay. <laughs> I'll I'll book an hour with you anytime. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I love you. Love you too. Thank you for having me as your as your guest. <laughs> oh my gosh, I, I I really don't know what to do. So before we hang up, I want to hang up isn't even the right word. I think there's a button I'm going to press, and if I mess it up, here's here's the worst that will be. You and I shared a holy moment on a bizarre digital platform, but if I get it right, and who, if I do, they'll hear me saying this. Um, we'll have created a conversation about testimony, which itself was testimony. Precisely. All right. I love you. I love you too. Abba. Okay. <laughs>